This is a University of Otago podcast. Right, well, here's a group of people from the, one of those central places um, that I know um, all of you who are involved in teaching and supporting distance programs at this university uh, draw on. Um, we can't exist without you guys. And um, so we're really, really pleased to have you here. And we have Jeff, of course, over there, whose, whose name is known so widely among the distance educators of this university. And uh, so Jeff's here too, but he's just sitting there <laughs> monitoring things, doing what he does best, which is really helping us to keep things going. So I'd like to introduce Kimberly Johnston, Luke Erickson and Ch Tosh Stewart for their presentation. Thank you. Um, now that I've already been introduced, it's probably a whole slide down the gurgler. Um, my name's Kimberly Johnson. I'm an e-research and e-learning consultant in ITS, part of Teaching and Learning Facilities. This is Luke and Tosh. They do the same job as me. Uh, we thought we'd take you on a little bit of a journey, um, probably not hugely academic based or anything like that, but a bit of where e-learning and e-research has come from, so maybe five, ten years in the past, maybe twenty. Um, Luke's going to tell you what's available at present, so what services we currently offer, what you may not already know exists, um, and Tosh is going to try and crystal ball gaze and tell you where you might be in 30 years time or maybe 40, 50, 100. We'll, we'll see where he goes really. Cool, so my journey is a bit of a trip down memory lane. Um, I want to take you back to things like the physical course readers. Now I know some people are still using them and there's still a use case for them, but just you remember those sort of, they were an inch thick and even on campus you saw the students lining up outside Uniprint to get their course reader for the year. And Imagine how many trees that was, quite a few forests in the years. We think about, we moved on from the course readers and you sent them out in floppy disks. Do you remember the floppy disk? So they ranged from an eight inch disc, which you know, quite large, floppy, um, up to the smaller ones that we're a little bit more use, uh, used to. Um, and that fitted a whopping 1.44 megabytes of data on it. Imagine all the things you could store on that. Now, Luke mentioned to me yesterday, he said, oh, you know, the save button in every computer thing you use, the image and the icon is a floppy disk. How many of our students have seen one of those? I'm not sure my brother would know what one was actually. Um, and slightly newer and a little bit more hip was the CD. So I've got, I've got an old CD here that I've managed to find and I've got DVDs and things like that. So times have changed. We've moved online a bit. Um, some of those things that you did have to go down to the post office and send out that massive course reader. We can save a few trees and make them into PDFs and put them up online and yeah, we've gone there. And other things that we've done, there's computer labs. They've sort of gone the way of the dodo as well. So. You notice around campus, lots of these computer labs are turning into other things. Um, Luke's going to talk a bit about how we've replaced them. Um, but we're now we don't really expect students to have to come onto campus to use the one bit of software that's only available on one computer in the whole place. So that's a bit of a change. I think those in the College of Education might remember Web Crossing. Yeah, Karen's nodding in the back there. Um, so Web Crossing was a forum software, so you could go on and try and get people to communicate online and forums. So things have changed there a bit. We got, we got a bit newer and hip and we got Blackboard Chat and Virtual Classroom. And if you go back and have a look at those things, they're awful. Um, but when they first came out, that was quite a change. Suddenly you could have people communicating synchronously. Um, that sort of stuff. So we've also got phone conferences. Now this was one of Jeff's little babies. Um, and Otago Connect, and that came out of distance as well. So. Otago Connect was our web conferencing package. Um, that's changed, and Luke will tell you a bit more about that. And phone conferences, we've probably got a little bit cooler. We've gone to video now, and you can have well, what was the access grid room and things like that, so you could actually see people. And I thought I'd chuck in Second Life. I'm not sure if anyone came across this in the past. Um, this was, I guess, a bit of a fad. Um, it was meant to be a virtual world where you could build buildings, and I know that. There was a bit of talk about building an Otago campus. I'm sure we had a little space in Second Life where you could go and walk around as your virtual character and meet people. I'm not sure how useful that is, but you know, we went there and tried it. Um, 
So if you, that's the ERA. So when I was saying computer labs are disappearing a bit, back in the day, that building or that room in the li central library was absolutely chock -a full of students and computers with a queue to get to a computer to use their piece of software that you could only access on university computers. So I'm now just going to take you through a bit of a memory drive. 1997, this was the university homepage. Looking quite classy. Step forward into 2003, we've got a bit more colour. We lost the bricks. <laughs> uh, what else? Now, I was at university for the last couple of these web pages, so I remember them, which is a bit scary. Uh, 2006, so starting to look for more. And we've got online registration, so it's new and different. 2009, still pretty similar. Um, Otago Choice came out then. Oh, Blackboard. So, Blackboard is one of e learning's tools. Um, so when I started university in 2004, this is what Blackboard looked like. And I'd love to say it had really, really changed. You see that it really hasn't. <laughs> We've got some new browser requirements and things like that. Oh, clock tower. And that's about where we're at now. Which hands me nicely over to Luke. Cool, thank you. Um, okay, so. I will talk about our sort of present day services that we have. So obviously we still have Blackboard, um, which is running strong and is you know, still used quite heavily, especially distance wise. Not, not really that much in the med school anymore, but still there. Um, so we've also introduced in the last couple of years Otago Capture, which is our lecture recording system. But uh, in the last year when Zoom came in, uh, in conjunction with Jeff, we set up a way of basically allowing you to record your Zoom sessions and put them on there and have a place for you guys to stream real-time video, well not real-time, but you know, videos that will actually adapt to the streaming uh, bandwidth of the internet that the person that is watching them has. It's sort of the same as what YouTube will do, but it's the only system we have that will do that, which has been quite good for some of those people that are in more rural areas and that sort of thing. Um, we still have our blogs and podcast system, which is WordPress. Um, YouTube is still around which is the, uh, another video streaming software. Uh, we have an iPad loan system now where you can book out class sets of 15 or individual ones. We've got two sets of 15 down here. We've got two sets of 15 in Wellington and hopefully we'll have two sets of 15 in Christchurch soon as well. Um, we still have our wiki system and our newer system is the 3D printing. So I've got some examples there that I'll talk about in a second. Um, and the other one we have is our surveys tool. So, so those are the e-learning um, tools that we have. But as part of teaching and learning facilities and ITS, there's also the student desktop, which is the replacement for the computer labs, and there's obviously Zoom, which Jeff runs. And I, I won't talk too much about Zoom because Jeff's here and I'll get things wrong. And <laughs> yeah. um, cool, so we'll start with Blackboard. So this is the newest login screen for Blackboard. It looks roughly similar to the older one, but um, now has a slightly nicer design. Um, of course, this will be upgraded in a couple of weeks on Thursday the 17th, and it will be out for a four or five days, so back on the Monday the 21st. Cool. Um, so inside Blackboard, we've got some really good sort of collaborative tools that I think you guys might find interesting. So. Inside Blackboard groups, you obviously have you have wikis where they can create their own sort of documents and that. Um, you have the discussion boards where they can talk about things inside the group, and you can also have discussion boards outside as well. And there's obviously journals, um, and then obviously the other collaborative tools, tools that we have inside teaching and learning, Zoom, that sort of thing. Cool. Um, so I'll just talk a wee bit about Capture. So this is a screenshot of one of the very first lectures we ever recorded. So it's, but it gives a really nice overview of how everything works. And so there's quite a few features in Capture that I know are being used by some classes, but I don't know if they're necessarily being used on by the distance students. So I think that's something that they should, they might find useful. So as a student, you can log in and you can watch this video and you can watch and you can resize all of the windows, you can do all of that. But the other thing you can do is you can also search through the slides. So people can go in and they can go, well, I want to know the what was on slide number four, search for the keyword that's there and it will find it for them and they can go to there. Um, the other thing that students can do is they can bookmark areas. So they can create a bookmark inside a recording 
it'll be on their screen when they log into Blackboard and go to capture, and they can go back to that at any point. And you as academics and lecturers who are responsible for these recordings will get a little wee heat map statistics of where these people have put bookmarks or what they're viewing over and over. So you can see what areas are more troubled than others and what aren't. So you can, can get those sort of statistics from it. It's just one of those features that we think is being used by some, but only by those that are getting told about it. It doesn't seem to be one of those ones that students just discover on their own. Cool. So speaking of statistics, there is uh, different ways that you can get some statistics on how students are using your, your data or your teaching and that sort of thing. So inside Blackboard, we have statistics tracking on items, which is the classic, how many views have you had on this item, how many views you've done. But there's also the retention center. So the retention center is a way of Blackboard keeping track on how your students are doing. So if your student hasn't logged in to Blackboard to your paper for five, six days, it'll let you know. And then you can let that e you can email the student and go, hey, I noticed you haven't been into Blackboard, I haven't looked at any of this for the last five days. Is something going on? That sort of thing. It'll also keep track of how well they're doing in the tests that you're running in Blackboard or in the assignments to just kind of keep an eye on at-risk students. And so maybe for distance that's quite good if someone is more in isolation and that sort of thing. Um, and there's also the performance dashboard, which will give you a more of an overview of each student and what they're doing. Um, just collectively, like, this is what they got in this test, this thing, but more than just the grade center, it's how many times they're logging in and all that sort of thing. So Capture obviously has more statistics as well. You can see how many views for each recording. You can track each individual student and see what they are actually watching and how much of each thing they're watching, if they're watching at all. And the little heat map that I talked about before that will tell you areas inside your recording that are more popular. And on a blogs and podcast system, and I think on uh, for other ones as well, you can have Google Analytics, and that will give you a whole range. Uh, I could talk about Google Analytics for a lot, but it's probably better if you guys look into it yourself and, and go from there. It's quite a easy system to use. Cool. Um, and so to replace the computer labs, teaching and learning facilities, in conjunction with a few other ones, have created the student desktop, which is basically a Windows 7 inside your browser. It has Office, it has any of the things. As long as you've got an internet connection, you can log in. Um, so it can log in via your phone, which, you, I mean, you can, but it still gives you a Windows desktop, so it's strange. Um, you can do it on your um, browser, or you can download a little piece of software to open it up from there. Um, it includes Office 365, so Office access all of the Microsoft Office products, and it's a really good way of students being able to use all of the software that they need without having to pay for it, or without having to be on campus to do it. And um, so I'll just quickly talk about our 3D printing. So we have a couple of 3D printers. There's some things here. Um, so some of the examples we've done for printing for people at the moment has been sort of teaching aids. Um, so this one here is a, it's not really a teaching aid, but it's a, a molecule that chemistry here at Otago actually created. And so we printed it out for them and they took it to a conference and showed it off. But this sort of thing, it doesn't cost that much and it's quite sturdy. I can just drop it on the ground, throw it around and yeah. So you could be able to send these sort of things in the post quite nicely. <laughs> um, so the other sort of ones we've got some examples of is a skull. So this is a fossilized skull that they found in South Africa. It's the Homo naledi, I think it is. Uh, so someone has done a 3D scan of it, and we've been able to print it out so students at Otago can actually study a fossilized skull without having to actually touch it. And it's, these sort of skulls are never going to come to New Zealand. So it's, it's one of those sort of ones we can do. And again, if you've got any things that you need your students to actually physically sort of feel and see, 3D printing is probably a, the way to go. Yeah. Yes. Um, and now I'll uh, pass it over to Tosh to uh, push the ball guys. Now, how do you work this contraption? I've never been very good with technology. <laughs> <clears throat> uh, 
Right, well, thank you. Uh, as Luke and Kimberly said, I'm the newest member of eLearning, so I think somehow they decided that it would be apt for me to take us into the future and talk about a few of the um, e-learning resources that might be coming up. And um, so when we gaze into the crystal ball, uh, we can see some things that are quite near to us and some things which are a little bit further away. And so I guess the very few things I'm going to talk about today range from um, things which we hope will be implemented within the next couple of years and things which are, I guess, um, more still sort of fanciful gleam in the e-consultant's eye. <laughs> Uh, so, uh, yeah, so, some of these are, are definitely coming, and some of these, you know, obviously you can take with a little bit of a pinch of salt. So in the very near future, we expect to have audience response systems in lectures. Um, these systems have already been trialed in limited capacities at Otago in some contexts, um, but we hope to have fully featured systems available very soon. Um, I think the benefits of these are quite obvious. Um, we all know that students uh, learn most, most effectively when they're engaged in the classroom and audience response systems give us one method of engaging students. If you're teaching a maths class, you can say, um, now that I've shown you the equation, can you complete these examples? And using their, um, the device in front of them, students can answer a question that you put to them. Another uh, possible uh, method of use is what I've called here, I don't know if it's a very good turn of phrase, but what I've called comprehension feedback for the instructor. Uh, if you're a lecturer, it's very hard often to know if your students are understanding you and following you um, all the way, if they're still on the boat. And if your students have a, the, the I don't understand button, then uh, I guess this might give you another way of trying to track how effectively you're conveying the information to your students. Um, so moving into the near-ish future, uh, this is, if we talk about virtual reality, um, one way that virtual reality might start to impact the education sector is through the use of virtual reality meeting rooms. This is, I think, particularly relevant for distance education. Uh, but Sarah, I was listening with interest when you uh, questioned whether we want to replicate the on-campus experience, and I think you can probably tell I'm fairly sympathetic to your view there because of my depiction of the classic campus in-classroom experience with the uh, asleep students. But nonetheless, if what you need is to tell the authorities that you can replicate the on-campus experience, then um, virtual reality meeting rooms where um, your students don virtual reality masks or outfits and um, immerse themselves into a meeting room where they interact with their classmates. This might be one way of getting just back to that, uh, that uh, sort of mode. When I've been reading people talking about meeting rooms, there's a lot made of the way you, you don't need to be constrained in a traditional classroom. You could be on an island with water lapping at the shore. Um, so yeah, there may be um, there may be benefits to to um, to having a more uh, lifelike and immersive experience in meetings and and classrooms from a distance. Um, slightly slightly less easy to work with virtual reality, but certainly um, certainly coming forward is the um, use of virtual reality training simulations. So. Virtual reality has the potential to put students actually in roles that you're training them for. The man in this photograph is a trainee astronaut and he's um, undergoing um, uh, on one of the, some of the manual training for an astronaut program. I guess NASA or the Jet Propulsion Laboratory might be slightly better funded than the University of Otago right at this moment, but um, nonetheless this is on the horizon. So we can imagine students actually being put in the role of performing a triple bypass operation or a root canal. Um, and it also opens up the possibility for really effective distance teaching of manual tasks. So um, some things which are quite hard to teach by distance without being there in person, um, virtual reality might give us a, um, 
a window into, into doing this. And moving into the most sort of fanciful end of the spectrum, just finally, um, there's, there, there's some promising, um, promising um, work being done on decoded neurofeedback. So if you understand my um, very, very nerdy computer joke here in the picture, then you probably know about the famous scene in The Matrix when the main character has martial arts training uh, downloaded into his brain. And he proclaims, I know Kung Fu. Um, now, obviously, I realize that's a fic fictional film. But um, nonetheless, uh, there, we're moving towards being able to do this sort of thing. Um, perhaps the use of fMRI data that measures the, records the brain patterns of very high-performing experts in fields. And that data can then be used to train the brain patterns of students. Uh, so looking forward into the future, um, there may be the possibility of more direct, um, d direct training using these sorts of electronic methods. Um, and just uh, finally, in the very, very near future, or perhaps not after President Trump has hold, um, we predict that all these e-learning methods will become irrelevant after we return to disseminating educational resources etched on wax tablets. Um, so that's just a snapshot of the things we see stretching into the future of e-learning. Um, and I think that we'd all welcome questions about any part of this talk. So thank you.